You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, and welcome to this afternoon's program at the East West Center in Washington, D.C. We're pleased to have with us today two uh, visiting scholars and uh, scholar warriors with us uh, to talk about one of the most important issues uh, in global affairs today, not just in the East Asia Pacific area, but globally. Uh, we have uh, with us Commodore J. Tariella, who's uh, the Philippine Coast Guard spokesman. You'll recognize him today from his many appearances as the face of much of what uh, the Philippines is doing in the West Philippine Sea throughout the South China Sea. And then Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey or Danielle, who is an esteemed academic who's uh, working on these issues. What we'll do in terms of the program is uh, that Commodore Tariello will give a presentation and then there'll be a reaction from Dr. or Danielle. My name is Hank Hendrickson. I'm with the US Philippine Society and I'm delighted to be a partner here at the East West Center in Washington uh, for this important program. And uh, we welcome you all. We're certainly glad to see you here and to show an interest uh, in the presentations that are about to take place. Uh, most of you here have uh, the speaker biographies. I won't go into uh, detail, except to say that uh, these two gentlemen are uh, have their arms around all the issues that we're going to be discussing this afternoon. They're highly knowledgeable, and you'll learn very much from them, I think, and that's the reason we're here. So with that, Commodore, over to you, sir. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for being here. I would also like to thank uh, East Coast Center uh, for allowing me to be part of the U.S. Uh, Philippines Alliance Fellowship, although uh, I won't be uh, Finishing the entire three month tenure fellowship and have to go back to the Philippines uh, by next week. Um, let me now uh, proceed with my presentation. Um, in February, Philippine Coast Guard shocked the world by releasing photos and videos depicting the China Coast Guard's use of military grade lasers against a Philippine Coast Guard vessel, causing temporary blindness to its crew. This incident garnered international attention with coverage in over 80 countries and in various languages. After two weeks, an aerial photo was publicized showing the Chinese maritime militia swarming in Sabina and Second Thomas Shoals. A few months later, Philippine Coast Guard embedded foreign media establishments such as Reuters, Associated Press, and BBC. Together, they released a video capturing a China Coast Guard vessel blocking a Philippine Coast Guard vessel at an alarming distance of barely 30 yards, leading to a perilous near collision. These photos and videos garnered significant international attention. This afternoon, what I will be discussing is what are the underlying reasons behind the Philippines' decision under the Marcos administration to carry out this transparency initiative utilizing the Philippine Coast Guard as its primary medium. I would argue that there are four compelling reasons why President Bongo Marcos has been relying on the Philippine Coast Guard, a civilian maritime law enforcement agency, to lead in exposing the Chinese aggression in the West Philippine Sea. Additionally, I will also delve into the potential implications of this action stemming from external factors. Firstly, I would argue that the Philippine Coast Guard has greatly benefited from President Duterte's policy of halting military engagement between armed forces of the Philippines and that of the United States. This policy shift, which spanned Duterte's six-year presidency, resulted in the United States redirecting its maritime security cooperation efforts towards the Philippine Coast Guard. Throughout this period, the U.S. Coast Guard significantly increased its capability training with the Philippine Coast Guard with an annual increase of over 10 folds. It is worth noting that within this U.S. funded training programs, the Philippine Coast Guard received crucial courses such as the International Maritime Domain Awareness Training and the Sea Vision 
system training workshop on an annual basis. These courses played a vital role in equipping the Coast Guard personnel with the necessary skills and knowledge to effectively document and monitor the presence of Chinese forces in the West Philippine Sea. Additionally, the Coast Guard officers and enlisted personnel underwent comprehensive seamanship training covering a wide range of areas from engine maintenance to navigation and ship handling. These training sessions were designed to enhance their competency and equip them with the requisite skills to carry out effective maritime controls. In addition, the U.S. government has also extended assistance to the Philippine Coast Guard by providing infrastructure and equipment to support their maritime domain awareness patrols and to monitor the movement of the Chinese maritime militia. Recognizing the logistical challenges faced by the Philippine Coast Guard vessels, which had to traverse the entire island of Palawan when deploying to the West Philippine Sea from the Birth of Princess, the U.S. government supported the construction of a facility in the southernmost part of Palawan in Bulinuyan. This strategic infrastructure investment has significantly improved operational efficiency, resulting in time and fuel savings of approximately four to five hours. With regard to the equipment, it is worth mentioning that the AIS transceivers installed on the Coast Guard vessels patrolling the West Philippine Sea, which are programmed to monitor the Chinese maritime militia and effortlessly upload data to Sea Vision, were provided as well by the United States government. Secondly, the Philippine Coast Guard's role in patrolling and exposing Chinese aggression in the West Philippine Sea is consistent with the regional norm of non-militarization and non-provocation. This is the second reason why President Marcos has entrusted the Coast Guard to lead the transparency initiative. It should not be seen as an escalatory tactic, but rather as a necessary measure for maritime governance. In accordance with the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea and the 2016 Arbitral Award, this underscores the fact that the West Philippine Sea is not a disputed territory requiring military intervention, but rather falls within the country's exclusive economic zone, which can only be safeguarded by, a by the maritime law enforcement agency to assert our sovereign rights. This approach is not entirely new. It is actually a continuation of President Noinoy Aquino's administration, which learned from the 2012 Scarborough Shoal standoff the goal is not only to avoid provoking China, but also to refrain from upsetting other Southeast Asian countries. The key di distinction lies in President Marcos' decision to empower the Philippine Coast Guard in exposing Chinese aggression and granting them permission to openly communicate this information to the public. He has transformed the Coast Guard's roles from being a mere presence keeper to an intelligence gatherer and ultimately the narrator of the Chinese aggression in the West Philippine Sea. Thirdly, it is also crucial to recognize that effectively amplifying the messaging would become challenging if the Navy were to take the lead role. Visualize the image of a gray naval ship patrolling the West Philippine Sea. Regardless of any provocative actions carried out by the China Coast Guard, public opinion would inevitably lean towards the white ships, which are perceived as civilian maritime law enforcement vessels. It is important to mention that China excels in manipulating the truth, particularly in shaping public opinion to favor their perspective, even in the face of their unlawful activities. We have already witnessed this when the Philippine Navy was deployed and they succeeded in portraying the Philippine government as a warmongering nation in 2012. Therefore, the current government under President Marcos has come to the realization that in order to gain control over the narrative of sharing the truth of Chinese hostility, which has been dominated by fake news and influenced by Duterte's pro-China stance over the past six years, certain measures need to be taken. It would be difficult to garner support from the United States and like-minded nations if the Philippines would be violating the regional norm of non-militarization. It is also important to note that since the Philippines began exposing Chinese aggression in the West Philippine Sea, 
our message has been consistently um, amplified by the United States and other like-minded nations. Whenever a specific incident is made public, countries such as the United States, Japan, Australia, and some members of the European Union also voice their criticism over Chinese aggressive behavior through media platforms. This external support makes it easier for the Philippine Coast Guard to convince the international community that we are the David in this scenario while China represents the Goliath. Lastly, the Philippine Coast Guard's dedication to its mandates aligns with the vision of promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific, a vision supported by the United States and like-minded nations. As a civilian maritime law enforcement agency responsible for maritime safety, environmental protection, and enforcement of maritime laws, Coast Guard contributes to the objective of establishing a rules-based maritime order by publicizing China's violations of international laws, such as UNCLOS and coal regs, and the disruption of the marine environment through practices like IUUF and large-scale reclamation, the Philippine Coast Guard's efforts align with the shared objective of exposing such actions. While sanctions against China for these violations may not have been witnessed thus far, the transparency initiative undertaken by the Philippines is a positive stride towards holding China accountable. Through increased awareness and pressure, this initiative has the potential to ignite a fire and generate enough pressure to hold China's China accountable for its undoubtable actions. As I have already laid down four reasons for Marcos' administration, it is also imperative that I have to highlight the key takeaways of the Transparency Initiative in the past months for the Philippine government. First, it is crucial to emphasize that the publication of Chinese aggression in the West Philippine Sea by the national government has successfully created public awareness among the Filipino people. During the six years of the Duterte administration, the country was polarized in terms of how are you going to view China, whether as a friend or as a foe. Due to limited information about the situation in the South China Sea during the Turkish presidency, false narrative flooded social media platforms distorting the truth. This misinformation led to many to believe that China was a good friend and it is a partner for peace and development. The rise of fake news for bears on social media channels further fueled the spread of false information, which became the primary source of news for 73% of the Filipino population. However, as the national government shed light on the harassment inflicted upon the Philippines by the China Coast Guard, public awareness increased significantly. This revelation sparked a surge in support for the Philippine Coast Guard and the armed forces of the Philippines in their efforts to patrol the West Philippine Sea. Factual accounts accompanied by compelling images and unsettling videos proved to be powerful tools in reshaping public opinion and debunking false narratives. Currently, surveys indicate that regardless of your social status or political inclination in the Philippines, whether you are supporting Duterte, the incumbent president, or members of the Liberal Party, Filipinos now unite in recognizing that China is engaged in aggressive and illegal actions in the West Philippine Sea. Secondly, another important point is the noticeable operational changes observed in the actions of China Coast Guard in the West Philippine Sea, excluding a initial. Prior to the Transparency Initiative, these vessels engage in shadowing activities by closely maneuvering alongside of the Philippine Coast Guard vessels within a distance of around 60 to 100 yards. However, once their dangerous maneuvers, which violated international collision regulations, were exposed, the China Coast Guard altered their shadowing approach. Instead of shadowing from the side, they now conduct their activities from behind. The China Coast Guard thinks perhaps that the Philippine Coast Guard vessels is documenting their actions while being shadowed. Third, the transparency initiative by the Philippines challenges and proved that China's previous warning and threats regarding the red line in Second Tama Shoal are all empty. Previously, 
The Philippine Coast Guard vessels were advised to stay away from the shoal to avoid escalating tensions with China. However, through its publication of aggressive actions of China Coast Guard, the Philippine Coast Guard has been able to come as close as 0.3 nautical miles to the shoal. Furthermore, Filipino fishermen nowadays are now able to enter the shoal in Second Promo Shoal and be engaged in fishing activities. This demonstrates that the red line in Second Thomas Shoal is a mere threat of China and has been undermined by the Philippines Transparency Initiative. Lastly, the Transparency Initiative by the Philippines has garnered significant support from the United States and other like-minded nations. These countries have not only amplified the Philippines' message, but have also openly criticized China's aggressive behavior in the West Philippine Sea. Moreover, their support goes beyond just amplifying transparency. The United States and these other nations have reached out to the Philippines, offering assistance in improving its capability to patrol the area and enhancing its maritime domain awareness capability. This shows that these countries are committed to helping the Philippines protect its interests in the West Philippine Sea. Furthermore, the Transparency Initiative has led to more countries being convinced of the importance of celebrating and supporting the result of the 2016 Arbitral Award. This was evident in the speeches delivered by the ambassadors of the United States, Japan, Australia, and some European countries during the anniversary celebration of the Arbitral Award last July 12 in Manila. The support garnered through the Transparency Initiative has reinforced the Philippines' position and strengthened international recognition of the importance of upholding the rule of law in the West Philippine Sea. To conclude my presentation, it is important to highlight that the success of the Transparency Initiative hinges on the people's belief in the pursuit of truth and the rejection of false narratives. It is important for individuals to have faith in the importance of exposing falsehood and recognizing illegal actions and aggression. However, for the initiative to have a tangible impact and bring about significant change, it requires active participation and concerted effort from all nations that share a disdain for falsehood, illegal action, and aggression. While the Philippines has initiated the Transparency Initiative, it is crucial to gather sufficient support to hold accountable those countries that believe that they are all about the international law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Condor. Now we turn to uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bordanielis, Director of Maritime Programs, for, for a reaction to the presentation. Yeah. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, I would like to thank uh, Frank Henderson here, the author, for uh, hosting uh, us this afternoon. Um, it's an honor to, to discuss uh, the presentation of my good friend, Dr. J. Doriella, whose leadership uh, and commitment to Philippine maritime security interests and the US Philippine Alliance have uh, been advancing in our space order in the South Country. So, what I'm going to do in the next uh, five minutes or so. Um, it's just to provide some uh, framing remarks in reaction to the presentation, uh, perhaps to generate some new thinking uh, about our approach to the South China Sea. Uh, and so I have here three simple assertions, mostly informed by my conversations with, with the Food People's Guard uh, and also uh, with my work as a forum uh, convening various practical dialogues over the past year. Uh, so first assertion is on uh, the importance of the transparency policy that's being championed with the Marcos administration. So I agree with uh, Commodore Torriello on the transparency policy. I think it is a prerequisite to any effort to push back against Beijing in South China Sea. Uh, winning the information war is, is critical to holding China uh, to account for its assertive behavior. Um, so exposing China's force of behavior at sea serves important purposes. First, it demonstrates the Philippines' non acquiescence to Beijing's unlawful claims, preventing any uh, assertion that the PRC has effective control over certain maritime spaces or offshore territories. 
Second, it rallies global public opinion against the use of coercion and force to press claims, making it easier for, for the United States and its allies and partners, uh, and largely the international community, to pressure uh, China. After all, if the Philippines was uh, silent in the face of Chinese bullying, then why would uh, other countries even say something about it? Uh, and third, as alluded by uh, uh, Commodore Ferriella, transparency makes it easier to fight disinformation in the Philippines designed to remove uh, the Philippines' agency on these issues. You know, uh, there are a lot of disinformation out there um, portraying the South China Sea issue as mere byproduct of the so-called great power competition, and so the Philippines should not take sides or should, should uh, sit it out. Um, so the transparency policy is, is a good um, pushback against disinformation and social media. Um, number two, the second assertion is presence matters. There are so many efforts uh, by uh, like-minded states to uh, increase the capacity of the Philippine Maritime Forces, in particular the Philippine Coast Guard. Um, but I think these capacity building efforts should revolve around strengthening uh, the Philippine presence in areas under its, uh, its control. Um, if we review China's gray zone coercion in the South China Sea, uh, say since 1995, uh, Beijing has been quite successful, right? Um, got, uh, for example, uh, the mischief reef uh, in 1995 was taken over through largely gray zone operations, uh, changed the status quo of the Scarborough Shoal in 2012, um, established new presence around uh, the Second Town Shoal, the Reed Bank, and many other uh, disputed features. Um, I think we all understand that these operations are successful because they are chosen to avoid the thresholds for escalation uh, and response. So China's use of civilian, for example, civilian or non-military actors like the Coast Guard or you know, maritime militia, um, and that these actors uh, use tactics that fall short of kinetic armed conflict make uh, uh, China uh, succeed in its effort to, to change the status quo. And the reason for that is because gray zone um, coercion results in paralyzed decision making, uh, at least on the part of the recipient of the, of the coercive maneuver. So uh, on the one hand, if, if the Philippines responds, it could lead to escalation, right? And nobody in Southeast Asia uh, wants to escalate. On the other hand, if the Philippines does not respond, then China would keep pushing the, the envelope in past tense. So what do you do? Right? So there's that uh, complicated balance. Um, so I think there should be a conversation about uh, two things. First, what capacity building would make these gray zone operations less successful in changing the status quo? So unless we can connect discussions with capacity building to what will effectively defeat China's gray zone coercion, then uh, I think we will continue to, to lose more features or more uh, maritime zones to Chinese uh, coercion. Um, also, there was one chapter uh, that I was, uh, uh, that I edited last, one chapter in edited volume that I worked on, uh, and it has a very uh, interesting argument uh, through empirical and formal evidence, uh, the use of brain game theory, the author argued that bolstering weaker allies' capacity to maintain presence could frustrate the gray zone coercion because it makes the presence immune to the coercion. In other words, because the presence is uh, hardened, then it, it, it makes it difficult for China to remove Philippine presence. Uh, whereas if the response is symbolic, for example, there is a coercion happening at sea and the response is a military exercise somewhere else or a symbolic visit by an high-ranking official, doesn't make any significant difference in as far as uh, preserving Philippine uh, maritime uh, entitlements uh, or presence. Um, and I think the second conversation uh, that, that the, the Philippines and the United States should have um, should relate to imposing costs on China, which leads me to my uh, third point. A name and shame may not be enough in the long run. The Transparency Initiative, it's a prerequisite to any uh, good strategy in South China Sea, but uh, it could be that in the future, um, it, you know, China can become immune to criticisms, and that more, you know, it can be more willing to accept reputational costs 
in exchange for tangible territorial or maritime gains, right? Because reputational cost, if you remember, the cheap wheat prices, the Philippines also sort of used megaphone diplomacy, name and shame China. It's called Rochelle, the same thing. Um, but in those instances, I think China was willing to suffer some reputational costs, which were temporary, uh, but in the long term, you know, it gained territories or maritime spaces. Uh, so I think there, there has to be a conversation about what are the acceptable costs that the United States and the Philippines are willing to impose on China. Not just these two, you know, in, you know, in coordination with allies and partners um, and the international community at large about how to hold China accountable. Uh, for example, the Scarborough Shoal, there is still no land reclamation there. But what if China builds uh, artificial islands in the Scarborough Shoal? I don't know if there's already a conversation about potential responses to that. Uh, responses that will go beyond symbolic uh, gestures of deterrence or commitment uh, or expressions of commitment, but something that will really stop the, the reclamation from happening in the first place. So uh, those are just some of the things that I have. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Um, in interesting points. Uh, now we'll open the session to questions and answers, and if I may, pose a uh, first question. And uh, it would be to look at, based on what uh, Commodore uh, Tariella has said and what has been amplified by uh, Daniel, is that the situation in the West Philippine Sea is today is characterized by uh, an effort by the Philippine government through the Coast Guard to sustain, and I think the word was to harden, uh, the presence there without militarizing the, the uh, situation. And there are advantages, as has been pointed out, to that. Uh, there would be other options uh, to that kind of uh, an approach. And the question is, uh, looking at other claims in the South China Sea and weighing the Philippine approach against uh, the tactics and uh, overall strategies of other claimants. Do you see a difference in approach and how do you weigh the effectiveness of various approaches, thinking of Vietnam and others? Well, if you're going to look at um, Vietnam, Malaysia, and even for Indonesia with their concern with the tuna, and of course with the nine last line, uh, all of these countries are developing their own Coast Guard organization. For Malaysia, you have MMBA, for Vietnam, of course, you have Vietnam Coast Guard, and then for um, uh, Indonesia, you have the Kambla, and the Philippines has the Philippine Coast Guard. Uh, all of these countries are utilizing white ships um, with the understanding that this is already a regional norm that probably we can give credit to what had happened in the 2012 Scarborough Shoal standoff, wherein um, the Philippines started deploying Philippine Navy, and we were criticized, we are the one militarizing the dispute when they were um, attempting to arrest Chinese uh, fishermen. So with this kind of development in 2012, we can see how these countries now are developing their own Coast Guard, um, hoping that they won't be you know, criticized by China or any other claimant states in the South China Sea, that they are militarizing the dispute. This is also in um, uh, alignment with the DOC that the, the South China Sea will not be militarized. Uh, that's why all of these countries nowadays are, have, are uh, developing uh, their own Coast Guard uh, and they are um, becoming the you know, uh, priority uh, option um, in maintaining their presence in the South China Sea. Thank you. I will turn to the uh, audience here. I would ask you to, uh, will you ask a question? Give us your name and your affiliation, please. Okay, sir. Hey, Jay, um, Research Association Center. Um, I'm, I'm from Japan and I've seen that Japan's been providing a lot of capacity building assistance um, in, uh, to the Philippines um, and even control boats. And um, you, you mentioned um, that we have to come up with um, a, a way to combat, like fight back, fight against the uh, Chinese prison. Uh, uh, origin. What do you do? You have any uh, suggestion or anything, anything that uh, the effect 
that you expect Japan and other uh, like-minded countries to do uh, for for the peace to have uh, better uh, to, to combat better against uh, Chinese trade uh, Well, um, uh, it's an academic, not a sports officer. As an academic, I believe that um, the best way for us to address Chinese aggression is to expose it. Uh, that's the reason why I support the transparency initiative. The more we expose this um, gray zone tactic of China, the more the international community will be able to recognize that these actions are unlawful or these actions constitute a violation of the international law. If a particular coastal state, not just the Philippines, would just keep on ignoring this uh, occupancy, for example, uh, and that's what Dr. Jeffrey was mentioning, that if you're not, if you're just going to keep on ignoring it, the status quo has been changing. So for the Philippines, I think our policy right now of using transparency, bringing it to the public, telling the international community that the Chinese is doing this, for example, swarming Chinese market militia, there is a certain reputational cause that uh, somehow alters their behavior. Secondly, I believe that the Chinese has been doing their actions in the South China Sea because they are they, they can be able to do it. Nobody questions it. So the more publication you tell the world, you expose them, that they are harassing fishermen, they are doing reclamation, they are carrying out dangerous maneuver, the more that the international community is in uh, unity to call out the actions of China, that you're not supposed to do that, you are actually violating the international law. If this gray zone tactics of the Chinese government would never be exposed, then that's actually the failure for the region, and it will always be a victory for China. I, I think it's also, in addition to just, uh, in addition to exposing China's bad behavior and fee, uh, one way to defeat the gray zone challenge is to uh, not be too afraid to take some risks. Uh, so some, I think some risk taking is is, uh, is warranted. So if you look at the, what happened in the Scarborough show, why was China successful? Uh, the Philippine interest was a return to status quo one day. The American interest was de-escalation. China was escalating. So if you, and eventually, of course, the Philippines and the United States de-escalate right, with a move to pull out from uh, from the show. So if your response to escalation is to de-escalate, then China wins by default. So I think there needs to be some form of, of risk taking. Um, and, and, and so as allies, the United States and the Philippines should probably discuss parameters about you know what are acceptable risks that would not lead to China succeeding in changing the status quo. Another question, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Lian. I'm a young intern here at the East West Center. So for um, the eighth, I I wonder how what uh, public opinion uh, changed since the previous uh, administration. You mentioned about uh, those narratives and misinformation. So do you see uh, any significant changes in the recent years? For Dr. Um, Daniel, you mentioned uh, some risks that the U.S. and, and the Philippines should take. Would you suggest anything specifically what risks the U.S. and the Philippines? Well, um, it is before I answer that, at least um, I can give you a background what transpired in the six years of presidency of President Duterte before uh, President Bong Bong was pushed for the transparency initiative. Um, well, President Duterte is a populist president. Uh, actually, when he stepped down as president, he still has an approval rating of 80% plus. So try to imagine how can he be, be able to change and shape public opinion towards China. And it's also, you know, it's an open book that President Duterte during his uh, tenure as a president has been very soft in China. Um, there's not much of, um, you know, criticism towards China in the 
South China Sea and how China um, harasses the Filipino fishermen. Sometimes those incidents that were out in Abidjan are even downplayed by the Duterte government during its presidency. So the influence of President Duterte uh, to his followers and supporters, whenever he says that you know we should not provoke China, they are our partner, they are our friend uh, for economic development. It alters the Filipino perception towards the Chinese behavior in the South China Sea. So with the little information that the national government is releasing to the public, the Filipino people is just reliant on whatever narratives and false discourses that Duterte would be telling to the Filipino people. In short, the perception of the Filipino people during his presidency is that uh, what is happening in the South China Sea is just an effect of great power competition, but not necessarily China being aggressive to take away the entire South China Sea. When President Bongo Marcos started this transparency initiative, making the public aware of what is happening, people now are becoming more aware of the photos, the videos, and the testimonies of the Filipino fishermen that they were harassed. Coast Guard vessels, um, sailors' lives have been jeopardized because of all of this. Uh, dangerous maneuvers the Chinese has been doing. Little by little, the Filipino people perceived perception during the time of President uh, Duterte has been changed to uh, real appreciation of what is really happening in the South China Sea. Um, I'm very surprised as a spokesperson of the Philippine Coast Guard. I can, you know, I always read the comments whenever I'm doing my interviews and whenever I publicize a particular incident. And you would see, as I said during my presentation, regardless of their political inclination, whether they support Duterte before, whether they are a supporter of President Bongo Marcos, or they have supported the Liberal Party under uh, Lenny Robredo, Filipino people are united in calling out the Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. All because of this transparency initiative, we were able to dispel fake news nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, on, on risk taking, uh, first of all, I think China is actually not building Cold War over the South China Sea. Uh, so, what I mean by risk taking is just to stay put if there is coercion. So, for example, if you go back to the Scarborough Show, we were too afraid to prolong the standoff because we feared that that could escalate into something worse. Uh, but, uh, if that would happen again, I think the Philippines should just stay put. And so what if the standoff persists forever? The bottom line is we do not allow China to exercise effective control over a feature that's clearly under uh, Philippine jurisdiction per the status quo. Um, they touch the vessel, that triggers the MDT, and I think that's a whole new story. Uh, so that you know that risk taking could be reinforced by the transparency initiative exposing China's bad behavior, and also by uh, the alliance that the the mutual defense treaty uh, should apply if there is any um, you know, anything that would uh, touch those vessels or an attack on public vessels, aircraft, troops in the South China Sea would trigger Article Five of the U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty. So uh, you know all of these. Combined, I think uh, uh, risk taking can succeed in defeating uh, China's uh, raise on coercion. Knowing that China, in my view, is not really willing to go to war over uh, the South China Sea. Okay, well, uh, here, here. Um, hi, I'm Bea with the Youth Center Young Professional Program. Um, the question is for the Commodore. Um, I was wondering, since Sarah Duterte, the daughter of Rodrigo Duterte, is currently serving as Juan Juan Marcos' vice president, is there any internal discord within the administration regarding the transparency initiative? Well, um, thank you for interesting <laughs> question. Uh, again, I'm going to answer this as an academic, not as a Coast Guard officer. Uh, it's a very tough spot. <laughs> I'll try. 
Uh, President Duterte, uh, Vice President Sara Duterte is currently the Secretary of the Department of Education. Uh, I think the other collateral duty that she's performing now is that uh, she's also a sitting chair for uh, the uh, task force in combating communism in the Philippines. Other than that, those are the portfolios that uh, Vice President Sara Duterte is currently having. With regard to the West Philippine Sea, um, as far as I know, she hasn't, you know, uh, made any statements as to um, how President Bobo Marcos is handling the West Philippine Sea. Fair enough. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Kyle and I'm a graduate student of the uh, an internet Asian society. I also worked with the community of our community, so this question would be more. Um, I was just wondering uh, what are your views on how it would be possible for the transparency initiative to kind of like survive or change changes? I feel like your Philippine foreign policy is highly dependent on who sits as the chief executive. One moment it could be somebody who prefers bandwagoning or balancing against China. So like as a, an officer in the Philippine government, how do you think that uh, this transparency surrounding what is going on in the South China Sea can last regardless of whether uh, who it is sitting as a uh, That's a very interesting question. Um, I believe that the transparency initiative that we have right now, um, if we're going to sustain this for the entire six year stretch of President Bongo March, it would be very difficult for the next presidential candidate to win an election if he would say he's going to you know reverse back this kind of initiative it is very important for us to understand that this transparency initiative didn't even happen during the time of president noy noy aquino because during the time of president noy noy aquino they were very careful in exposing and publishing anything that concerns the west philippine sea because during that time, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the national government is pretty much um, uh, careful and cautious whether uh, those publication and um, release of information would affect our case in the international tribunal. And then, of course, President Duterte obviously never publicized anything. And then President, uh, um, now the current President, President Bobo Marcos, has led this kind of transparency initiative. And with what I said a while ago, Filipino people, regardless of your political inclination, regardless of your social status, I was able to, you know, uh, see the Filipino peoples being united in this particular cause. So if your question is, do I believe that um, in the next coming election, if ever the president will, you know, reverse back with uh, the strategy of President Bongo Marcos. I think by elect a presidential campaign alone, the Filipino people would be very more, very much more careful in identifying their candidate. Because, as I said, this is the only issue that we have right now that the Filipino people are united. And if any presidential aspirant would say otherwise, I'm pretty confident, crossing my fingers. <laughs> that he won't be. Hello, I'm Monica I'm the recent executive of the Asian Bias. Um, you mentioned this earlier, and this is for more self the reasons that this is what I'm working on at AMTI right now. Um, do you think that the Looking Post are going to ever widen the scope of the actions that involve the sensitive towards more non traditional issues such as IMU fishing? Um, because I know that China currently is the biggest perpetrator in terms of IP fishing and also giant clam harvesting within the South China Sea. So, is there any chance that the post guard would ever publicize impacts on more of the environmental side as opposed to the Uh The Philippine Coast Guard has been patrolling the West Philippine Sea for a very long time already. Uh, since, as I said, during the time of President Aquino, we have already taken the front seat strategy in the West Philippine Sea. We have all the documents and uh, we have all the evidences of uh, IUU fishing, the effect of uh, reclamation, 
the cyanide effect in the corals, the giant plum harvest. Um, this, I mean, in the, in the screening parlance, it might, this might be considered as non-traditional screening, but we still believe that these issues are very relevant in um, strengthening our case against China because they are, we know for a fact that they are the one that supports IUUF. We, are, we know for a fact that the Chinese are the one um, doing the harvesting of this giant plant. And we also understand that the cyanide that they're doing in those corals in the South China Sea is actually an impact of what, with what they are reclaiming in different areas in the West Philippine Sea. Um, for the Philippine Coast Guard, we believe that this information needs to be made available to the public uh, for, have, for us to have a much more diverse appreciation of what uh, the Chinese has been doing in the West Philippines. Thank you for your time, Tom Dora and Dr. Neil. Uh, my name is Barage. I'm another young professional at the Eastwell Center. And my question kind of deals with, do you feel like the Lessons of Transparency Initiative can be replicated and used to cooperate with other countries such as Vietnam and also India, which do have border disputes with China? And if so, how do you feel like that has been tailored to suit those countries specifically supporting their war security space? Well, I have to be honest with you before I answer that. I'm not an expert in <laughs> India-China border, but I'll take, um, for example, China, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, since we started this transparency initiative um, in the Philippines, um, it, after we gained so much international support from the international community, the United States, and other uh, like-minded states, um, we kind of noticed that it's also Vietnam has also been replicating this kind of strategy, and also with Malaysia. Um, so, yeah, I think the transparency initiative that we have right now is uh, worth replicating, um, particularly on those countries that are experiencing gray zone strategy of China. And um, as I said, the only way that we can counter the Chinese maritime gray zone is for us to expose it. Sir, um, I'm in the Sorry, I'm sorry about being late. I wouldn't be detained because I really wanted to see this the Philippine position on China's land grab in the South China Sea was always utterly inexplicable. I don't know how big turning, but I thought America was afraid of its threat to China stealing their territory territory but um what uh, i hope it's, it's online you, you may have answered this but i um they now have uh anti-aircraft missiles in, in all of these uh islands right uh have they actually painted any aircraft flying overhead and i think there's any likelihood they're just going to shoot down one of our reconnaissance planes or something like that at some point during, you know, some heightened tension between submarines or naval forces there? I really don't want to speculate that they, it would be a possibility or not. But as uh, what Dr. Jeffrey or Daniel said, uh, we believe that China won't go that far um, because um, doing so would escalate and, you know, come up with a war between the United States. And um, based also on my understanding of Chinese behavior, um, China won't really go that far in, you know, engaging the United States to come to war in the South China Sea. I think the Chinese will continue to push the envelope um, if there is no successful pushback, or if there is no meaningful cost. Uh, so recall, for example, when the Chinese started building artificial islands in South China Sea, the Obama administration said there would be consequences. They finished the land reclamation. Then there were indications that China was militarizing the artificial islands. Then evidence came up that indeed fighter jets were deployed, missile silos were constructed. In other words, China successfully militarized the island. The Obama administration was warned before there would be consequences if China continues to militarize the island. 
no consequences whatsoever, right? I think they finished everything. They were able to successfully build a fortified, uh, several fortified features. So, so unless there is a cost, um, I think China will push the envelope. But I don't think China will actually like fire on on a U.S. aircraft or on a U.S. vessel. Um, they will just continue to use tactics or or, or uh, uh, actions that fall below the threshold of an arms attack. Because they have been successful, right? So why change strategies? Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Just sit in the back. That's Stanley Clover. In response to the last, how do you explain Korea of the 1950s? You came right at us. Jeff, we're going to take the back. Think about unprovoked attack right. in 1950 in Korea and, and post yeah. We were not expecting it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because they, we thought they wouldn't take attack the mighty superpower. They came right at us with full board. I think there's a. I, 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 I feel like with uh, Apple the Orange, um, that was just a few years after the second world war and uh, i don't know i don't really know uh how to respond to that but i i, I definitely well you think man yeah. after the second one, they suffered 20 million casual 20 million dead in world war ii and yet just a few years later they came right at us not too many people would do it I, if, if i might and thank you for the question i mean Having worked in Korea myself, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of the answers to what happened in Korea had to do with the foreign policy at the time, uh, whether it was perceived to be within our sphere of defense, and, and then uh, the uh, Korea Peninsula specific issues uh, at, at the end of World War II with uh, North Korea and South Korea. Uh, and. Uh, in that sense, looking at the South China Sea, it may well be apples and oranges. But it's a it's a fair question. But let me then conclude here with with a, a question. Since we're we've moved to Northeast Asia, that uh, both uh, Professor O'Daniel and Abdur Tariel have worked in Japan, studied done policy studies in Japan. Familiar with that. Our focus today is really on the Philippines, but maybe you could leave us uh, with a sort of a broader view of, of the region and look at perceptions that you gained yourself from your work in, in Japan, in Northeast Asia, perceptions there about challenges in the maritime zone in Northeast Asia today, and compare that with challenges in the maritime zone in Southeast Asia, and whether or not there's there are any common approaches uh, where it might be useful um, to deal with the challenges in a coordinated way and where there might be differences that would prevent that. Maybe I'd start with, with, with Jeff on that to, to, to bring that um, good follow up. Uh, so I think there are so many things that are common uh, between the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Uh, the, uh, the PRC has been uh, using raids on the coercion against the Japanese as well, um, deploying maritime militia vessels, uh, sending Coast Guard vessels into the territorial sea and the contiguous zone of the San Capri Islands. Uh, so the same sort of scenario. I think the biggest difference is um, the Japanese are more equipped to deal with these issues. And so, for example, for the Philippines, when there's, a merit, when there's a militia vessel, I think we're simply, I don't know, if, uh, maybe Jay can talk more about that, uh, but I think we are simply looking at them, exposing them, but not doing anything against, you know, to, to sort of push them out. The Japanese policy is, if it is, if they don't recognize maritime militia. The Japanese look at maritime militia vessels as ordinary fishing vessels subject to law enforcement measures. So the Coast Guard, Japan Coast Guard, can in fact do law enforcement activities against militia uh, because they view them as not instruments of state authority, 
they are not sovereign immune, subject to law enforcement measures. But the Japanese are also uh, conscious of the fact that they can't do that with a sovereign immune vessel. So, for example, if, uh, if it's a Coast Guard vessel, if it's a PLA Navy vessel, they're also reduced to simply watching, observing. Um, if it's an aircraft, they scramble their jets, but recently they have decided that they would only do so if, if the formations are very provocative. So they don't scramble anymore every time there's, a, there's, an, there's an intrusion. So to a certain degree, China is slightly succeeding, but the status quo remains that the sent up islands remains under their expression. Uh, both are US allies. I think there should be coordination in how, you know, how, what are the lessons learned from, from the East China Sea and South China Sea? Um, and how to bolster deterrence and again impose costs on China should China escalate uh, further uh, in, in the escalation level. Okay. Well, for um, in terms of common approaches, um, I think not everybody um, has been aware of um, how the Japanese have to survive their own uh, protection of sea trade routes, unlike the United States, where they can always rely on the United States Navy. And Japanese, of course, do not have that kind of luxury, particularly after the end of the war. Um, since, you know, sovereign um, sensitive Southeast Asia would always hate to see three ships in um, Malacca Strait and South China Sea from the 60s or 70s. But um, what I would like to highlight is that most of the time we always look at how White House in the region are have been, you know, are on the rise. Um, sometimes we try to give the credit to the built work to uh, the Southeast Asian region uh, about the development and rise of the Coast Guard organization. We forgot to realize that it's actually Japan who started deploying White House in a contested war. The Japanese Kaiju Wanjo, Maritime Safety Agency, or the Japanese Coast Guard now, are the first Coast Guard vessels that were deployed in a disputed border in St. Paul. And from that kind of um, uh, lesson, we can draw how the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam are using their White House to ensure their presence in these contested wars. And China is also following that kind of uh, you know, model from Japan, expanding their territorial claim using white ships so that they can hide from that gray zone strategy saying that they are not militarizing it, but rather patrolling it because for them, these are just waters that belong to China. Uh, it's not Southeast Asia, it's not China, it's Japan who taught the region that it is the White House whom we can rely on in maintaining our presence without actually provoking other claimant states in a particular war. Thank you, Commodore. And thank you very much to wrap up here. We've learned very uh, a lot about the role of the Coast Guard and really the important central leading role of the Coast Guard in uh, the West Philippine Sea and the government of the Philippines policy there and, the, and about the transparency initiative. So those two uh, factors, I think, stand out to me in the presentation. And, uh, and I think we've learned a lot. It's not something that many of us, even those of us who follow this, uh, were aware of before today. So we really appreciate you coming here and uh, enlightening us. And please join me in thanking our presenters today.